Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Dina Gosofsky. Um, this is Endo Found's uh, webinar, Endo 101, Back to Basics. Uh, I am joined by Endo Found uh, board member, Dr. C uh, Carly Goldstein. She's a gynecologic surgeon at the Sechkin Endometriosis Center. And Jessica Mernan, she is an author, podcast host, and endo patient herself and an advocate. Um, so we want to sort of uh, get the focus back to uh, the basics, you know, what endo is discussing diagnosing and treatment options, pain management, nutrition options, both physical and mental health. Uh, Dr. Goldstein was kind enough to prepare a short presentation for us. So I want to give it uh, away to her and then we'll follow up with some questions based on that and some questions uh, for Jessica. So good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us and logging in. And um... Just, I wanted to give a quick overview. Thanks so much for the introduction, Dina. So I um, am a gynecologic surgeon. I specialize in endometriosis and I've trained uh, exclusively, you know, with Dr. Suchkin at the Suchkin Endometriosis Center the last three years. Um, and before that was a resident at Lenox Hill Hospital in New York for four years. So, so I've dedicated the last you know, seven years to endometriosis surgery and training. And this is definitely um, a complicated, special field that really requires a dedicated focus. And uh, really, uh, I was a patient myself and a patient of uh, Dr. Suchkin and, you know, decided to dedicate, like he did, uh, my practice and life to this cause after dealing with it myself and overcoming it and, and doing really well after having the right treatment and surgery and everything. So, um, so I just wanted to start with that and I will get into a little bit of the basics, but this lecture is not really long enough to have time to talk about all of endo and what is endometriosis? It is endometrial glands and stroma that can occur outside the uterine cavity. So not inside the uterus, but when we look inside the abdomen and all different places in the abdomen. And these frequently occur, even though, you know, there may be little endometriosis stuffed animals that show endo spots on the uterus, that's not usually where it occurs. It actually occurs outside in the pelvic cavity around the ovaries, typically sitting on top of the bowel um, in places called the cul-de-sac along the bladder. And really anywhere in the abdominal cavity, it's free to go. It can even go up to the diaphragm and seed into the lung in very rare cases if there's a hole in the diaphragm. Um, it's a benign process, but we, we as endosurgeons really hate that word because we spend sometimes two to seven to eight to nine hours on one surgery, and it's by no means benign for us when we're tackling this disease, right? So mm -hmm. it's not cancerous, and unfortunately, when people's surgery is delayed, they're saying it's elective, but for us, it's really not a benign process, right? Um, it causes terrible destruction, adhesions, um, can even cause in rare cases, kidney malfunction and kidney problems and lung um, collapse. And so for us, uh, benign is a terrible word to describe something like this, right? Um, it causes extreme inflammation and a lot of scar tissue, painful periods. But you have to remember that it's not, endo doesn't always cause painful periods. Some women, uh, like myself, didn't actually have painful periods. I had bowel symptoms and pain and issues the rest of the cycle. And so I even didn't really suspect it was endo at first because my symptoms didn't align with the painful periods. Um, causes painful intercourse, irritable bowel-like syndrome, and you know women can undergo countless endoscopies, colonoscopies before really finding a diagnosis. And we're going to talk more, a lot more about that bowel, those bowel issues today with uh, Jessica and how to combat that with different foods and things like that that you can work on at home, even aside from surgery. Right? Um, it can cause infertility miscarriage and the symptoms can really be from minimal to severe. So some women can have no symptoms at all and they could just have infertility and miscarriage and they may have endo. Um, it affects starting young women. Some women can even have bowel symptoms before they get their first period. They could st start with nausea and different things before the periods even start. And uh, throughout reproductive age, but even post-menopause, even post-hysterectomy or post-ovaries out, sometimes there are uh, remaining lesions that can produce their own estrogen source and hormone and can, and can still cause problem. We estimate, it's said at least one in 10 women, we think it's probably more like one in eight, and not everyone receives an official diagnosis. So those numbers may come up if, if people actually all were diagnosed. Um, and infertility patients can be as many as 50% of infertility patients have endo, um, and that could be silent, okay? 
Um, how does it all start? We, we don't have enough time in this lecture to get into it. There are very many theories on it. And this is a beautiful picture with uh, aqua blue dye contrast Dr. Suchkin started and we like to use to really highlight small lesions. And these lesions you see are one to two millimeters. They're just blown up on the screen. But um, so in other lectures, we'll get into more of the theories on, on how it starts. Uh, what are some things that you should ask your doctor or your doctor should be asking you? If they're really trying to pinpoint endometriosis, uh, these are questions that, can, that we ask in our office and that can really help to pinpoint the disease, right? So how are your periods? How painful are they? Do they happen with heaviness, clots, ovulatory pain? Do you have laterality about two weeks after your period? Do you get right-sided pain, left-sided pain, pain shooting down your legs? Um, bladder symptoms, urgency, frequent urination, bowel symptoms, gas, bloating, endo belly, a lot of people call it nausea, diarrhea, constipation, trouble emptying stool, rectal pain, um, blood in the stool, and of course, leg pain, back pain, hip pain. We had a question if hip pain and leg pain can happen, absolutely. Um, chest pain, you can even have shortness of breath with your cycle, typically day two or three when that happens. Um, and a history of trying to get pregnant for a long time, not getting pregnant, history of infertility, miscarriage, or very painful intercourse. And that's a big uh, thing that not many other things cause painful intercourse on deep penetration. And that's a, um, a really good sign that there may be something going on with endometriosis. And then we always ask about other health disorders. Many times patients can have other autoimmune disorders and other um, issues but we like to you know see they're not always related to endometriosis and endometriosis is not autoimmune however patients do seem to have you know other issues with thyroid disease and bowel syndromes and sometimes anxiety depression other things that we always want to uh, include and, and find out about ahead of time and if your doctor doesn't ask these questions these are things that you want to bring up or look for in a specialist that really can find you know, where all of these lesions are located, right? And help you get your life back. Um, what can, one thing that you can do in the meantime before getting in to see someone, uh, one, I encourage telemedicine. We're offering that and a lot of practices are even before they can safely get back into the operating room. Uh, we're helping streamline the process with telemedicine. But one thing you can do is actually to use a period tracker app. And there's one created specifically for endometriosis research and that's called FENDO. Um, and I put this on here and we uh, have collaborated with Dr. Al Haddad before, and this is great to track your symptoms in the meantime for when you get to your doctor. Um, the initial stage treatment of endometriosis is first uh, pain relief with ibuprofen, naproxen, Tylenol, things like that on your period. And when women are first in their adolescence, this is the first line sort of treatment. Um, and you can even start at the day before your period when you start to get little symptoms and then try to get ahead of the pain. Um, and then next stage is really, uh, many doctors may try birth control suppression, but not all patients tolerate it. It you know, has to be up to the patient. And then there's also hormone suppression from above, which uh, we you know, don't typically use and are not uh, a big fan of because of the hot flashes and bone density side effects. But again, we'll go more into alternatives to these things in this lecture. And then diet and lifestyle, we'll talk a lot more about today. Um, diagnosing and treating endometriosis, now, you know, you can have a very, very high index of suspicion without ever having surgery that you have endo. And if we really hone in all, all of these questions and you know all these symptoms, then there's possibility to have a very, very high presumption that there's endometriosis there, right? Um, but if you do have a laparoscopy, it's important that people treat it at the same time. So we're no longer just doing laparoscopies to see endo and then get out and then put people on hormones, right? Um, you, it's important to actually go in and when you utilize that time under anesthesia, you actually treat and get rid of the disease at the same time, okay? Um, so I just wanted to show you a few cases. These images may be graphic if you wanna close your screen and you don't wanna see them, just hear my voice. I think it's important as a surgeon that we just show a couple cases of how this disease can really look and uh, instead of cartoon pictures show you what really can be there. Um, we have a lot of patients that don't get their surgical videos or pictures and they don't really know what happened inside. And uh, we think it's very important to, to be able to be transparent about that and show women 
um, the depth that this disease can really do, right? Um, and this is where I think you'll agree with me by the end of seeing these that it is not uh, benign, right? Um, so this is early stage endometriosis. Uh, these are peritoneal lesions that start out small and we can see them with these blue contrast technique, but then they can get deeper and deeper and seed uh, into the organs that they are in and surrounding. Um, there can be ovarian involvement. These are pictures of lesions on top of a ureter that we're highlighting with green dye. And the ureter is the pathway from the kidneys to the bladder. They can even go into these uh, distant organs where, uh, and cause trouble with the kidneys and trouble with organ function. And this is how really you can imagine when you have these lesions all around the bowel and the bladder, uh, why this would cause bowel and bladder symptoms. And we'll get further into that. But you can see uh, these pictures on the top are pictures on a bladder and how many lesions there are in that bladder. And when you look at the picture below, the ovaries are in white and the lesions are surrounding and underneath. And whenever uh, someone would be standing or sitting, the bowels would actually rest all against these lesions, right? And so, um, you know, this really shows why uh, all of these surrounding organs can develop symptoms as a part of this. This is kissing ovaries, we call it. When the ovaries have such large cysts, they're actually sticking together. And we do see, if we, we like to do surgery on the time of a woman's period, and we can see that on this patient's uh, cycle, she has all of this blood actually sitting in her belly. And so this is when, unfortunately, women are dismissed in the ER but uh, for being on pain in their period, but sometimes there's actually blood sitting in there that makes them feel really terrible and nauseous and it creates an inflammatory environment, right? Nobody likes to, nobody's belly likes to have all of this sitting in there, right? And, you know, in advanced cases, this is what we like to see normal anatomy we put together with the uterus visible, the ovaries. This is a good looking pelvis. And if you look at the top left, this is a severe case of frozen pelvis where we can't even see the ovaries. The uterus is uh, attached onto the upper bowels, you know, and on the lower right picture, we can see even on the diaphragm near the liver bed and the upper diaphragm. Um, so really, I don't want to uh, go crazy with these pictures, but I just wanted to show you guys some real images of I think that was super helpful. Um, and I just want to turn to Jessica. And I think that a lot of women, even though their symptoms are different, um, especially mentally, we're sort of all going through very similar things. Um, what I've heard women say they feel very alone in this. Um, they, they feel like people don't understand them. So I just kind of want you to touch upon, um, you know, your story, a little bit of your story and how specifically you find managing your symptoms more helpful. And if you can include the sort of nutrition aspect of it and diet and just some of the things that you do to make it manageable. Yeah, thank you. And I wanted to say, I know those images are sort of graphic, but it's almost comforting to see them, to know that there is something wrong with you inside, because I think we question it so much that we're just like, oh, like I know for instance, my sister, she just questioned that she had any pain at all. And then when they opened her up, they had endo everywhere. So it's nice to see those sometimes to know that there is something happening. Um, I have endo, I was diagnosed, I think I was around 28 or 29 and I had multiple surgeries before seeing Dr. Sechkin and Dr. Carly Goldstein that were not great surgeries. I had ablation surgeries, which I think now knowing what I know made it worse. And um, I was headed for a hysterectomy. And then a friend intervened and told me about how diet and lifestyle tools could help. And of course, I thought she was crazy because if these things could help, why didn't my doctor tell me about them? But I decided to try it. And after just a few weeks, I started to notice a little bit of difference and I was able to get out of bed more, which meant I could exercise again, which meant I felt less sad. So I, I wish that there was one lifestyle tool that could knock everything out. I mean, obviously it can't stop endo from growing, but I think what they can do is give us some hope that we can actually manage it and maybe go to work and go on a trip and do these things that we want to do that are normal things that our friends and family are doing just by changing up little things in our life. And um, Dr. Goldstein, we're obviously living in absolutely unprecedented times where we have to actually manage these symptoms while at home. Uh, most of the country is sheltering in place, actually most of the world. 
Um, so can you talk a little bit about what we can do uh, at home, whether again, like Jessica said, it's diet, exercise. Can you talk about some specifics that might help manage the pain? Sure. Um, so we don't, we don't uh, use heavy dose or opioid medication in our practice. Um, we typically advise doing a rotation schedule with ibuprofen and Tylenol. And I know women may think that doesn't really work well and uh, we're being you know, dismissive of pain or something like that. But I can tell you as a patient and as someone that's had several surgeries, um, when you do these on a schedule, and so if typically you know, the day before your period, you may have loose stool and you know the period is coming, then you can start on a schedule with ibuprofen and Tylenol where you can alternate them every three to four hours. So you could take ibuprofen um, you know, up to 600 milligrams and then three hours later, you could take uh, two extra strength Tylenol. And then three or four hours later, this is when you're having severe pain, um, you can take the ibuprofen again. So you're, you're setting on a schedule that's actually staggered and that will help rather than being on something, relying on medications every six hours and then um, really getting to a point at four or five hours where you're in a lot of pain. And we actually use that post-op as well and it works very well. Um, you know, I, I also think that Epsom salt baths, things that you can do to try to relax musculature and um, stop some of the surrounding pain sensors can really help too. I think, unfortunately, with everyone sort of sheltering in home, we're also hearing about a lot of back pain, stiffness um, from sitting and not really walking enough and getting out enough and exercising. So I think incorporating a stretching routine, there's lots of free videos online with yoga. Some physical therapists are putting their own uh, back exercises and things you can do online. And so I think trying to incorporate something like that into your daily routine can be really helpful. Um, and there's, you know, some great yoga poses for the pelvic floor that uh, can help to sort of relax the lower back and open the pelvis a little bit and try to help you when you're having acute pain or bowel issues. Um, you know, there's certain positions that you can do to try to relieve some of the pressure in the belly and, and gas positions and things like that. Um, so I, I think those things at home are, are very important. And I also think having a support system, right? Being able to talk about it with friends. Um, I know, and Jessica can tell you too, there's lots of endo support groups online, um, but we're you know, trying to find different ones as a foundation too that we can help send patients to because it's nice to have friends that are also um, dealing with it and going through it and, and then you can talk. Right. Um, so yeah, I think that I sort think, of support system is good. Yeah. Go I was ahead. just going to say one other thing about the exercise thing, because I think online, when you read exercise is great to lower your cramps. It's like when you're in pain in bed, you can't even fathom going for a run. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, then we do nothing, but I think like you said, it could just be simple movements, even getting mm -hmm a foam roller or those little Franklin balls just to kind of roll things out. Like it doesn't have to be running a marathon. It can be right. little things in bed even. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's really great. Uh, finding those positions that actually give you relief. And um, I actually studied in osteopathic school. We did a lot of manipulative work with patients and I don't unfortunately use it as much now. I've forgotten a lot of it, but, um, but what we do always we did learn was that you always try to find a position of ease right mm -hmm. and then when you can find that position of ease like if you're having a back spasm then you don't want to hold yourself in a way that will continue to contract all of the muscles around it right and I think endo when you're having the worst pain it can be the same way sometimes you can really get excruciating stabbing pain in the rectum and you can't move and you have to just freeze up and stand there until it passes or that wave comes over um, but I think that when you can find, you know, there's some restorative yoga positions and things like that, that you could use. And you could literally just sit there and use a heating pad and find the place that your body feels the most comfortable. And then that will help to sort of allow you to do breathing and sort of relax everything else around. Right. And so though that's what I'm more talking about. And then when you're feeling your best, then you do more of the heavier exercises mm -hmm. and things, but yeah, treating your body with comfort and really well. And so that it can sort of help you to get all of the nice feedback and breathing and relaxation going from elsewhere, right? 
Uh, there are so many great uh, viewer questions, so I want to get to them uh, very quickly. Um, I do want to ask just one more question, and, and a lot of the viewer questions sort of um, have to do with one another, which is great. Um, you talked a little bit about this, about support groups, but I want to just touch uh, with both of you on the mental health aspect of it. Dr. Goldstein, are you seeing more patients who have had um, uh, inflammations or are triggered by the stress that I, I think it's fair to say we're all facing? And if so, can you talk a little bit about just dealing with the mental health aspect of it? Sure. Um, I think right now with the stress of COVID and what's happening and people don't know what's happening in the world and with their jobs and everything, I think there's definitely um, heightened stress. And I'm seeing a lot of patients that have trouble with sleep right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do you know, a couple of things that um, help with sleep at night. Um, there's a couple of valerian root based things that can help with relaxation, um, you know, with calendula and chamomile. And sometimes uh, patients can have, you know, higher strength melatonins and, and things that can help um, during the night with sleep uh, trouble. But I also think that, you know, we work with a psychologist who's fabulous and uh, he's doing uh, telemedicine visits with patients if they feel like they need to talk and uh, need a helping hand right now, then um, I certainly encourage having a support system, a therapist, a psychologist, someone that you can talk with. Um, that's outside of your normal group of family or friends. Sometimes it's nice to just have someone experienced with endo and with pain that you can really go over and get into all of this with, right? Um, and I think that reducing some of the stress around all of this is really important. I think that we don't need to read 20 reports a day about what's happening uh, with COVID, you know, it's not changing that much on a day-to-day -day basis. And so if that stresses you out, try to not focus on that before bed. Don't watch repetitive news stories and read all of these feeds all night long or right before you're in bed. Uh, I think it's important to have a relaxation routine and try to do a hot bath before bed with Epsom salts and get into a different state. Read something fun. Read, you know, my professor in college used to call it beach literature, like things that you can just read and be lighthearted about, right? Or watch something silly movie. Um, I think all of these things can help like lower your systemic stress that uh, we're not heightening in and focusing on everything else, right? And then we'll all do the best we can when we're allowed to operate safely and get everything up and running, we'll do the best we can to get patients back and, and everyone on the schedule and everything, you know? So it's important to realize it's gonna happen and we're gonna get there, but we're just doing this uh, according to the safest way to keep everyone healthy, right? And, and um, help everyone out. That's on the front line that we're so grateful and indebted to that's really uh, has been slammed and you know, we need to sort of uh, allow them time to get everything controlled, so. And Jessica, is there anything in particular that, that you do um, in terms of mental health that you think might uh, benefit other people if they knew about it? Oh, two things. I feel like one, this is going to sound so trivial, like go for a run, but I'm telling you puzzles have been helping me so much because it's just allowing my brain to focus on something besides stress or pain. And I mean, there's tons of studies that show art and puzzles and things like that can really help just kind of calm your system down. And then also when we were talking, I saw this book, this book, has really helped a lot. And I know it looks a little bit woo-woo yoga, but actually there's a ton of science in this book just about how, it's called self-compassion, about Who's how- the author? Because some people actually asked in the Q&A, can you recommend oh, yeah. some books? So this is great. Kristen Neff. Okay. And it's really cool because she's actually a research scientist. So it's not just be positive. It's about how giving more self-compassion to yourself can actually change how your brain processes pain and processes. So this book has been awesome. And if you don't want to buy the book, she has an awesome uh, episode on the 10% Happier podcast. So I love this book a lot. This is great because people were specifically asking for, for book recommendations that, that could help. Um, so thank you for that. Um, yeah. Uh, just a uh, sort of a two-part question. Um, I know that in doing my research over the several years about this, um, there's such there's very little funding from the NIH uh, for this specific issue, even though it affects so many women. Um, people out there were wondering, are there any startups um, who are working on endo research and possible endo cure? Because it seems like we can't really rely on the government to to issue the funds necessary for this. There are, you know, we 
put on every year, the Endometriosis Foundation puts on a conference, medical conference and research conference. And uh, we always invite uh, different startups. Most of them have been focused on diagnostics and trying to achieve a blood test or a uterine biopsy test um, in order to find out a diagnosis for endometriosis without surgery. Uh, so most of the startups have been geared towards diagnostics uh, to date. And then the therapies as far as medications, um, you know, there are larger trials being done with, um, you know, hormone suppression. And those medication trials are done on, uh, you know, a new drug that came out this year, last year, or Lissa, and um, on some that are still in trials uh, in the next few years that hopefully will have a little bit less side effects and, and uh, be applicable on a more a wide scale, right? And so um, I would say that the, there's not a lot of small startups I know, I could be wrong, about uh, treatment of endometriosis. The, the drug therapy are large trials and uh, big uh, pharma companies. And then the um, small startups that are focusing on diagnostics, um, you know, we try to group everyone together and give everyone uh, an opportunity to really uh, bring their ideas to the table and try to find out if we can all collaborate and come up with uh, maybe like a panel test like uh, we have for breast cancer that we could do ahead of time, which would be really nice. And um, you, you sort of mentioned this briefly. I've had a lot of questions about medication, specifically mm -hmm. um, birth control to manage system uh, symptoms and if this is the only option. And what about the people who are concerned? They don't want to fill their body with hormones. Um, there was a question about Mirena as an option, but that has its own side effects, uh, progesterone, and um, whether or not the birth control, which seems to be, and I want Jessica to weigh in on this, um, because I know that you've talked about how you manage your system, uh, symptoms in terms of exercise and mental health, but I'd love for both of you to talk about medication. Uh, specifically if birth control seems to be the only clear-cut option and what about the people concerned about both hormones and if they're trying to get pregnant um, is that a deterrent or could it be in the near future sure Jess do you want to talk first well sure I mean obviously Dr. Goldstein will cover the medical side but I can tell you that I was cuckoo on birth control it made me feel I would say borderline suicidal I hated my family, <laughs> I just did, it really put me into a deep depression. And I tried multiple ones. My doctor kept pushing it on me, but for my body, I just found that it made my symptoms worse. So I think it's something to be very aware of, of when you do start these medications, what the side effects are, because I don't know that we're always told the extent of them. Um, so yeah, I would just be cautious. And obviously, Dr. Goldstein can speak more to the medical part of it. But yeah, they didn't work for me personally. Did you find it frustrating that there weren't sort of more options um, for this kind of thing? Like, how did you kind of cope with that? I guess, in my mind, I just, I don't know, I, I feel like I got so frustrated that I just decided to take it into my own hands. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I know that that's not always a solution. Because I mean, I had a surgery two years ago and I, I had a 10 centimeter cyst. That's not something I can do on my own. But I think that in terms of managing those other things, it is seeing a therapist, it is eating right, it is making sure to move my body even when I do not want to. So to me, those are my forms of medicine. And sometimes it's not always easy to do. I got really mad when I had to change my diet, but now it's the thing that I use to manage my pain. So. Yeah. Dr. Goldstein, just if you can talk about the yeah, sure. and other medications. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, we have to say that these medications, while they're not always ideal, for some people, birth control is great. It works right. really great and they're happy on it, right? And they can be on it for years and years and it really works well for them. And sometimes endo, when it worsens or their symptoms worsen, they start to break through that ability of the birth control to really help. And, um, and we do see that happen, you know, when we when we see patients in the office. But um, not all women like the birth control, and um, but it does have its role for really managing pain and managing the amount of blood that you have with a period and managing symptoms. Right? It's not a treatment. It doesn't get rid of disease. Um, it doesn't get rid of the lesion. So even if you're on it, 
uh, it's not that you can get rid of an endometrioma and like just said, shrink it down to nothing and get rid of it. Um, unfortunately, they're not magic, right? And they do have side effects. And so, um, but some people saying that really do tolerate it and they like it. But I think that your doctor should always be open-minded that if you can't tolerate the side effects, you just may not be a good candidate for birth control. It may not be your thing. It may not work for you, right? Um, and Mirena IUD or IUDs, I think they definitely have their role, right? And some women, again, this is, I know this sounds a little bit washy, but some women really love the IUD. I personally had one. I loved it. It lightened my period to two days of spotting. It really helped. And um, I liked not having the systemic side effects from hormones. And um, I didn't have the bloating or weight gain or any problem with it. So for me, that was a localized hormone control that really works in the uterine cavity. The progesterone in an IUD is focused on the endometrium. It stays within the endometrial cavity mostly. It has a little bit of effect elsewhere, but there is no systemic hormone suppression from an IUD. And that's important to remember. And so the IUD actually doesn't even suppress the ovaries. So if you have ovarian pain with cysts with ovulation, it wouldn't suppress that. Um, and that's why women can remove the IUD and get pregnant right away because there's no suppression from above down, right? Um, and so I think that's important to think about. The IUD many times has a bad rep, but it's used much more commonly in Europe. And there is a role for the IUD in endometriosis. And uh, some women may have it and they feel great on it and do really well. Some women may have it, they feel terrible, they want it taken out right away. You know, I, I can't, I don't have a magic barometer of what patients will do best on. And so I think that it's important you know, Dr. Stutch can always taught me and we learn from our patients every day by hearing their stories and what's going on and their symptoms, right? And so um, every patient, you know, you really have to speak up and, and say what's bothering you, what works, what doesn't work. And we as doctors should really listen and, and help to hear that story. And that really helps us to know what's happening as far as the disease goes and where it's located and what will work for you and what doesn't. Um, and I do do some uh, hormone balancing with patients as well, not always with birth control pill. I do um, bioidentical compounded hormones, and I work with patients on achieving balance with every hormone that should be natural in your body, what's there, what doesn't work, um, and what happens you know, if you have lost an ovary due to surgery, or your ovaries failed early because of endo, or things like that. Then we can always, there's a way to achieve balance that doesn't always involve just bombarding you with estrogen that you don't feel well on, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that having an open discussion and really finding a doctor that can one, listen, and two, have other options for you. If you don't tolerate, you know, thing one, then you have some things in your, um, your you know, toolkit that you can try other things, right? Um, I think that, also um, the if there's no IUD and they're just taking sort of birth control um, mm -hmm. in the regular sense, I guess you can say, um, there were questions of should, should we be concerned that that could affect fertility as well if you're on the pill specifically. And there were a few questions about whether or not freezing eggs is a good idea um, if you know you have endo. Because I feel like it's a double whammy, right? I mean, some women, like you said, everybody's shown different symptoms. So some women don't even realize that they have this until they get try to get pregnant and can't. Um, sure. so, so talk a little bit about that if you can. Sure, absolutely. So birth control pill uh, patients should know anytime they're on it and they've started on it that it can take several months for your body to establish regular ovulation again. So after you get off the pill, if you're under the age of 35, uh, for instance, a fertility visit, a fertility workup will not be covered by insurance until you've been off of the pill for a year. Why is that? It can actually take up to a year for your body to resume normal ovulation. So we cannot say, you have trouble with fertility until you've given it a whole year for your body to reestablish ovulation. So I think that's uh, an important fact that we don't always talk about um, with the pill, that there is this suppressive effect and it can take your body a while to get back to normal. And um, again, that doesn't happen with the IUD because it doesn't suppress the ovulation, right? And so that is something to think about with the pill. If you And I always think that timeline, I work with patients with you know, if they're thinking, oh, I'm going to try in a year or something like that, then I suggest getting off the pill at least six months ahead of time if you can tolerate it, um, if they're on it, to try to 
so that you're allowing your body time to pick back up to normal, right? And then we do other things in the meantime and um, then, then having that suppression. Um, as far as egg freezing goes, you know, I talked with Jessica about this a lot too. Uh, you know, it really depends on the patient themselves. And if your goal is really to have your own biological child, your own genetic material, and you really want, um, you know, uh, that chance and, and a baby, then um, I think it's something that everyone should consider at least having, you know, a fertility sort of workup earlier on and having a knowledge, fertility knowledge in your 20s on, okay, how do my ovarian hormones stand? How do things look? Uh, does it seem like things may be more difficult? And if that's really my goal and it's something that I can achieve um, affordability wise, then, you know, uh, it's an option to try egg freezing when you're in your 20s and before things have um, gotten sort of out of control with with the pelvis and with fertility. And I think that uh, that's a very different thing than now that's happening rather than 10 years ago, right? When I was in my 20s, the egg freezing technology was not that great. 50% of them did not survive. And now you can freeze eggs in your 20s and use them in, when you're 48 years old, if you'd like. And, and so the freezing technology um, has been really perfected that, you know, many, uh, almost all of them will survive the thaw now. And then, you know, they have to be fertilized and it's a complicated process, but at least uh, you can rely on the fact that if those eggs are of good quality, um, then they can do really well and be safe for the future. And it, it may not, you may not ever need them, but it may just be sort of like a insurance package that you have sitting there. And one day, if you have trouble, um, then you can go back and use those eggs from your 20s. And whenever you froze them, the age that you were at, that's the age that risk is based off of. So when we talk about, I know this is going into a complicated thing, but when we talk about risk of pregnancy after age 35, risk, higher risk of Down syndrome and genetic problems, that risk is frozen. If you froze your eggs at 23, that's the risk that you have of a 23-year-old mm -hmm. from those eggs, right? And so that's kind of cool. That's really neat that we can, we can have this snapshot. And so uh, for me, myself, I went through three years and 10 rounds of IVF and all kinds of treatments and surgeries to try to get a baby. And so, and so much loss. And if I had had that option to have my eggs at 20 or 25, for me personally, it would have been really amazing. And so I don't ever push that on patients, but I certainly think that if it's something that's really, really important to you and your goal in life has always been to be a mom or you're that baby person, baby magnet or something, and, and then I think it's something that it's, it's nice to have uh, to think about, right? And to consider as an option. And we're trying to um, help get you know, more awareness for this so that maybe endometriosis can even be hopefully one day will be covered egg freezing, just like cancer is, right? And so um, it's certainly considered on a higher priority now, just behind cancer, but many uh, fertility practices are starting to really put it as a priority uh, to allow this education for younger patients and really give them options. So I think that's fabulous. That's something that we didn't have five, 10 years ago, right? Yeah. Can I say and one more thing about yeah, it too, yeah. Tina? Uh, I also feel like it's not talked a lot about in the endo community that a lot of people with endo do not want anything to do with pregnancy for their body because they've already had so much trauma. So I think I personally adopted my son because I just didn't want to be pregnant. So I think I've been hearing more and more people feeling more confident to speak up about that. But I think that a lot of times adoption is, or surrogacy is seen as a second or third choice. But if you don't want pregnancy for your body, that can also be your first choice. That's yeah. an excellent point. Yeah, I, I wanted you to share your own experience. So I'm glad that, that you did, um, because I, I don't think people uh, talk enough about that. And, um, you know, if there's anything you want to add, please, and just to even give comfort to people who might be in, in the same boat, right? Yeah, I just knew from a very young age, I told Dr. Carly this, I think that I just knew that I did not want pregnancy for my body. And I don't know, if it was some sort of divine endo and like, that, like they're like, don't want to be pregnant. You might not be able to, but I just knew I always wanted to adopt and it was the coolest thing I've ever done in my life. So I know that a lot of times we get pressure from our family. What kind of kid are you going to get? Like there's all of these 
horrible questions that people ask, but it is truly an amazing experience. And um, there's actually this brand new show called, uh, what is it? Waiting or looking? I'll, I'll, let me Google it, but it's a show that just premiered on Apple about this really cute British couple that's adopting a baby. And it's just, I don't know, it's really sweet. And I think if anyone, it's called trying, if anyone is interested in adoption or that route, it's a really cute show. Thank you. Um, I just want to um, also uh, bring in some more viewer questions. And I guess this is kind of an okay segue, but um, there were questions about specifically why sex is painful. And it seems like sometimes that's not discussed. You know, we talk a lot about heavy periods and other symptoms. So can you just talk a little bit about that and also like what um, we can do to manage? Sure. You're asking me, Dina, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's, that's one of the reasons why I tried to show some pictures of that back of the, the cul-de-sac on, um, on the surgical pictures, but basically, um, and this is very, very important and not all patients are comfortable talking about it. Um, but we try to put it on a written questionnaire too. So if you don't want to talk about it, at least we see it on the responses, right. And then we bring it up. Um, but it's something that, uh, hopefully you can find a doctor that you feel comfortable talking about this with. It's very important. And sometimes that's the patient's only real symptom that they have is painful sex. And that's what brings them into the doctor, right? And um, this can be really destructive on relationships, right? And um, it's unfortunately, uh, you know, something that I think a lot of women may deal with, but not talk about enough. Um, and hopefully people are getting more comfortable with that. Um, and the reason why is that a lot of endometriosis, when it starts on the pelvic sidewalls or uh, starts in what we call the cul-de-sac is the area, if this, if my fist is the uterus and this is the bladder and this is the bowels and we're kind of looking at me from the side like this, a lot of the disease starts and goes right behind the uterus, right between the uterus and the bowels. And that's called the cul-de-sac. And if you imagine this is the uterus and this is the vagina, when you're having intercourse and specifically deep penetration, these areas can be really hit and cause a lot of pain. And so there may be one particular area or side, and that's why women will get pain more in some positions than others, is that it may be hitting on a specific lesion or area of scar tissue or fibrosis. Um, and that you know deep scarring can actually cause the tissue inside the pelvis instead of it to give like normally, uh, like a, if you pushed, if you punched into a sheet, for instance, or a curtain and it just moves. Instead with endometriosis, it can cause adhesions and fibrotic scar tissue that's really thick, like band-like, and it doesn't move or give. And there can even be nodules there, like almost like little stones that get stuck in the tissue. And that really hurts whenever um, there's, there's deep penetration or that area is hit. And that's why sonograms can even be very painful. Vaginal sonograms and vaginal exams or speculums could be more painful for endo patients, or even some patients have pain with a tampon. And that can just be the position or where a lesion is located in the back of the cul-de-sac, right? And so even after excising these areas, uh, you know, we try to make sure that everyone feels better from that perspective and really that that exam and sonogram are a lot more comfortable on that six week post-op mark. We hope that things will get easier by that point. Uh, but it does take sometimes um, some down regulation with pelvic floor therapy or actively breathing and doing exercises afterwards. Even when you get these areas removed, you also need to be able to uh, lessen the feedback and be comfortable again. And that takes time because your body is used to tensing up and as a response to pain. And so many times it takes you know, work and sometimes even work with therapy or pelvic floor therapy or exercises or you know, relaxation, a glass of wine, trying to breathe through things to say, okay, the stimulus is not there anymore. Um, I have to allow, you know, my body time to breathe and get into this, but then, you know, the pain stimulus may be gone and your body can and, uh, get through it a little bit uh, easier and more enjoyable, right? But it, that may take a little bit of time, even after the stimulus is gone, that you have to rework how your body sees it and recognize it. And that's because, um, you know, with intercourse and with the vagina, many times it's easy to tense the pelvic floor as a response to pain. And so endo patients, 
don't need to do Kegels and tighten their pelvic floor, I tell them, you know, that would make things worse because we're so often in pain that you're, you know, you're tightening uh, without even knowing you're doing it um, as a response to pain, right? And so many times when they work with endopatients and, and pelvic floor exercises and things, they're actually teaching you how to use feedback to lower the, that uh, pelvic floor response and, and stop tensing so much. And so um, these are all things that can be practiced and take time to work on afterwards. But I think that, you know, one, it's important to remove those lesions from the areas that are really causing that stimulus. And then afterwards to sort of, you know, allow your body and mind time to get through the feedback and, and be more comfortable again. Uh, Jessica, I want to direct this question to you because um, um, I know you mentioned this, but there are a lot of questions coming in to be a little bit more specific about exactly what kinds of changes you made to your diet. Like, I think people actually want to hear, like, what do you eat on a regular basis? Or when you're yeah. feeling uh, pain in particular, what helps you that's absolutely not medication, but just food? Okay. I mean, one thing that drives me insane are those YouTube videos that are like, what I ate in a day, because I feel like every single day is different. And I feel like every single body is different. But I think that overall, I think that reducing our inflammatory foods, so the big inflammatories being sugar, dairy, uh, red meat, gluten, processed food products, I think doing our best to limit or eliminate those altogether can be extremely helpful just because so much of it, so many of us have GI symptoms. Mm -hmm. And because, because endo is an inflammatory condition, if you think about it, those inflammatories are just adding fuel to the fire. So I think really focusing on as much as you can, whole foods, not the grocery store, but foods in their whole form is an incredible way to do that. And I will say, I mean, I wrote a book called One Part Plant. It's a cookbook about how I changed my diet and the recipes that helped me. But I think that it is a little bit tricky in the beginning to just overall your whole diet, especially right now when we're limited to what groceries we can buy. So I think really just focusing on, okay, how can I change one meal a day? How can I change two meals a day? And I think really being aware of what foods make you feel good and what foods make you feel bad. Because I think that we can, if we can kind of tune in more and say, okay, after I just ate that big block of cheese, wow, I have really bad diarrhea right now, or I'm really constipated, you can kind of start putting things together. We don't always want to hear the answers that our body are telling us, but I think it is a good indicator of how to start to eat a little bit better for our endo. So I think take it one meal at a time, but I think that it, if you give it your all, I think that you can notice at least some difference in some of your symptoms. Uh, Dr. Goldstein, uh, I apologize if you hit on this earlier already, but th there are even more questions coming out about specifically um, about pain after her hysterectomy. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? And um, is it normal? And, and how do you manage that specifically after such a, a big surgery? Sure. So it really, you know, we'd have to evaluate this on a case by case basis. We can't generalize something like that, but um, it depends one, if the hysterectomy was just the uterus, the ovaries are still in place. Um, it depends on if they had excision at the time of hysterectomy or they just had a hysterectomy out and then endometriosis was left behind, right? And so those are all factors when, um, we're dealing with this that we have to really examine and look at pictures and look at what happened in surgery and then where these symptoms are occurring and how they're examined, right? And, and how things feel. Um, so it really depends on what type of surgery and what was left and if the ovaries are still there. Even in women that have had uterus out and ovaries out, it's still possible to have endometriosis. And I think that's really important that uh, you're not dismissed. Sometimes these surgeries don't cure everything, right? And we call it definitive surgery, but there may still be lesions behind. Um, you know, ideally, if you're having a definitive surgery, you wanna remove all of the endometriosis lesions and possible stimulus at the same time. Um, but sometimes there may be one or two millimeter lesions that uh, you can't see or microscopic foci that we can't even see at the time of surgery. And those are possible to still sort of linger afterwards or maybe come back years later if the ovaries are still there or if the ovaries are out, but you've been on high estrogen replacement therapy, and then you feel like that's making you have symptoms, maybe it's stimulating some lesions. And so um, I, again, I think it's important to 
one, find a doctor that's not going to dismiss that. It is possible that endo is still there after hysterectomy. And then we really go into case by case, what type of surgery you had, what's still there, what hormones have you been on, what medications are you on, uh, what pain medications do you take, does that affect the bowel symptoms? You know, we have to get into uh, the nitty gritty case by case, but I will say generally, it is possible to have endo after hysterectomy and uh, even after ovaries out as well. And that sometimes very aggressive disease and very aggressive lesions uh, produce their own estrogen supply. and it's really terrible, but they can. They can produce their own supply that's helping feed them, right? And that's where uh, I think things that we're talking about with Jessica with low inflammatory lifestyle and diet and things I always work with with patients as well to try to decrease feedback we can from other sources, right? So some patients even change their job. Their job is too stressful and, and they're not sleeping enough and they're working too hard and commuting too much and they really reduce stress feedback in all different areas of their life, right? And then when you do a low inflammatory diet and you try to eliminate things for a couple of weeks and then slowly introduce them back in, um, then I think, like Jessica said, we can have a feedback from the body on what, what made this happen, what made this happen. Did I eat a whole bunch of birthday cake for two weeks in a row because I went to so many birthdays and then my period was worse that month. You know, um, I think those things are all really important. But hysterectomy, it is possible to still have pain after. And uh, we have to evaluate what happened in the surgery. If you have the videos, the pictures, everything, go through case by case, and then what medications you're on, uh, what possible stimulus are there, um, does diet relieve it? You know, there's all kind of different things that we can we can look into. Yeah, I think it's just important for women to know. Okay, this is you know a lot of times they're labeled as crazy because they're like, okay, I have this pain, then I have the surgery. It's all miraculously supposed to go away. So I think it's sure. important, even generally, to say, hey, no, you're right. This could actually happen. Um, so thank you for that. Um, we're we're kind of tight on time, but I, I do want to get to these two things, and hopefully I can combine it, uh, Doctor. Goldstein, there was a question about whether or not pregnancy and having a child can actually help reduce endometriosis symptoms, if there's any connection there. And then the second part of that question is whether or not um, you can pass it down to, to a daughter, let's say. Okay, sure. So I'll answer the easy one first. There is definitely uh, more common to have endometriosis in families. And so um, there is a genetic uh, linked to endometriosis, and it is more common if your mom or aunt or grandmother um, did have endometriosis, then the likelihood to get it is a little bit higher, right? And so there is a, a chance of that, right? And um, of passing it down. Um, and the other question, just remind me, I'm, uh, the I, other someone just texted was, me at the same time. No, no worries. Um, the other question was whether or not um, both pregnancy and having a child could actually reduce endometriosis symptoms okay. in the long run. Sure. So um, I think it's important to say symptoms versus disease. I think that's a really important point. Um, you know, I think that the progesterone in pregnancy, uh, for me personally, when I finally was uh, able after all of that to, to have a pregnancy, uh, for me and many patients, the pregnancy itself is easy compared to what you deal with with endo, right? And so the acid reflux of pregnancy and things like that aren't bad because you're in comparison, dealing with periods and the cycle and the menstrual ups and downs all the time, um, there's so much progesterone in pregnancy that the balance is, I think, much better. Um, so pain-wise, uh, for me personally and for many patients, I think that your symptoms can be diminished in pregnancy. One, because you're not menstruating. You're not having a cycle for at least nine, 10 months. And if you breastfeed, you can prolong that longer, hopefully. Um, but so for many patients, they're able to have a really nice break without taking any foreign hormones of just not having periods and not having those cycles and those symptoms. Um, I do see a lot of patients that after breastfeeding or after being pregnant, sometimes their symptoms can come back or they can worsen. And some patients, they changed. They, things got better. The period changed after pregnancy and things did get better. Um, I would say it's not, you know, it's not across the board as far as um, one way or another. And I, I think that it's a misnomer for doctors to tell patients pregnancy cures endo. It doesn't. It doesn't get rid of lesions or disease. Um, you may feel better because of the progesterone balance is higher. And uh, if we could bottle up that progesterone and put it on the market, that'd be great. But the synthetic versions of it, unfortunately, don't feel the same as what it does, you know. Um, and so I think that symptoms can improve. And then 
afterwards, after pregnancy or breastfeeding, if they do return, uh, sometimes they change or they're a little bit different for patients. Sometimes it returns to the same full force. Um, usually those lesions are not gone. It's not magic, but, um, you know, we evaluate everyone and see, you know, what has changed afterwards. And, and certainly it's possible to still have endo, but some patients do notice a difference afterwards. Um, but I think it, again, it's a mistake to say that that will cure it and you'll be fine after and, you know, or you'll be too busy or something and you won't, you know, come back or something. I think that's a huge mistake we have, we need to acknowledge. Okay. Jessica, I want to just um, turn to you uh, really quickly. Um, and, and actually this question is for both, um, but we're like tight on time. So I'm hoping you can answer the question, maybe have some closing thoughts um, just to let the, the women on here know that they're not alone, um, the women on here and their partners. Um, but uh, there was a specific question about uh, what to do when the endometri endometriosis specialists unfortunately aren't in your area or where you're located. I mean, uh, I know I'm lucky living in New York City, Dr. Sech and Dr. Goldstein are right there. We have some of the top specialists there, but a lot of people aren't that lucky. So talk a little bit about your experience finding um, the doctor who works for you and actually going to see them. I know a lot of people have, have to take flights, you know, and not just domestic flights, international flights, just to see doctors like uh, Dr. Goldstein and Dr. Sech. So can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, right now I'm writing a book on endometriosis and Dr. Goldstein is helping with it. And I'll have to say it's been the hardest part of writing the book is the emotional aspect of just not being able to get care because we can say all these things, but then it's like, if you don't have a doctor living in your area, then how are you supposed to get this care? So I personally, I was working with a doctor here and when they found that huge sis, they wanted to cut me open, give me a laparotomy. And, and I'm sorry, when you say here, you mean in, South in Charleston, South Charleston. Carolina. Yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> and uh, I knew I'm not having that done. I've had that done to me once before. So I knew that I needed to find a specialist that would not have to do that. And that's how I found Dr. Sechkin and Dr. Goldstein. But yeah, I mean, it was a very big expense. I, to be totally transparent, I had to borrow money from my dad um, you know, these costs are significant sometimes. And I think it's really hard to find sometimes a doctor. And I, and I think if you're not able to find a doctor that's an excision surgeon, I think the first place to start is to at least find a doctor that is open to it, one, listening to you. Because I think that sounds like an obvious thing, but it's not. So I think finding a doctor that will listen to you, one that's open to other types of care besides just the first line of defense is take this hormone. I want to give you a hysterectomy. I think when you meet a doctor and that's the first thing they say, it's like, okay, wait a second, let's get a second opinion. So I think, yeah, if you can't get to an excision surgeon right now for a surgery, at least find a doctor maybe where you live that can care for you in those first steps. Wouldn't you agree, Dr. Goldstein? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that you know, we're certainly, you know, we do case reviews and, you know, we can do free case reviews and things like that. It's, you know, and the mission of Endometriosis Foundation really is to promote advocacy and research and education, right? And so um, we're trying as a foundation to find more ways to help patients across the board, right? And so, and that means education too, and educating of medical students, physicians, residents um, on how to do proper excision surgery and advocacy on a government level to try to get these surgeries fully covered and not be out of network and not have billing codes and you know all of the issues surrounding insurance and reimbursement. And so it really requires you know a whole uh, system trying to attack this. And, and so we're certainly you know always willing to do case reviews and then try to help you find a plan in your local area or when that traveling does happen or at least come up with strategies in the meantime and then i think as an endometriosis foundation you know really promoting education and advocacy on a government level talking to your local uh, um, government sectors and everything dr suchkin's been on the on the train and car to albany and protesting and and things and and uh, he's gotten, you know, period bill passed that we can talk about periods in schools and painful periods and endometriosis and not just about sex education. And that's really important because if we can start with education uh, younger and younger, then we can really hopefully uh, widen, lessen this time to diagnosis, lessen this almost 10 year time to diagnosis, right? And so 
I know we're running out of time, but um, but I think that's really important as as part of the foundation's mission is to really try to help with education and advocacy and awareness. Um, and then hopefully, you know, we can come up with more of a system that, you know, there's all different excision specialists or people that will go through fellowship training in endometriosis one day and, you know, and really have more access to care. And all of that starts, has to start somewhere. And we're working on it and we're fighting it, but we also need your help and support and everything. And so we really appreciate everyone attending and, and coming and, you know, being a part of this and we need help obviously and ideas. So. And, and people can log on to endosound.org, right. And, yeah. and learn more and, and submit. Absolutely. Questions. And there's um, one more poll going out. So um, if the participants want to answer that, it'll just help us um, in the future to decide not only what time works best for everyone, but what kinds of topics that people want to talk about and getting into more specifics about um, endometriosis and pain and management and all that. Um, I want to thank you so much. I, I thought this was, so informative and thank you for the presentation thank you for sharing your personal story i know a lot of people a lot of women will benefit greatly from that um again dr uh, carly goldstein and jessica mernan thank you so much uh, for doing this thank you absolutely have a great day everyone Bye.